Vienna, Austria. That's right. We're here to talk about Austrian economics. I wouldn't be here if it wasn't important. We can't talk about the Austrian school of economics without mentioning Friedrich Hayek and his road to serfdom. Because that's what socialism leads to, is serfdom, totalitarianism. Because government is trying to control the economy. The only way you can control the economy is to control the people. See, the free market, no one's trying to control that. It happens one way or the other. And when, it, when a need is seen, it's filled by whom? By someone, by someone who recognized the need, by someone who took a chance. Um, socialism is real. I realized I didn't have to come all the way to Vienna, Austria, just to talk about Austrian economics. But it's that important that I wanted you to know about it. <clears throat> now, it was Carl Menger who wrote a book in uh, 1871 called The uh, Principles of Economics, and uh, he really began the Austrian school that was, um, as opposed to the British school, the British school that led to um, John Maynard Keynes and that, that environment. <clears throat> but the, the Austrian school of economics actually goes back as far as St. Thomas Aquinas and uh, some of the, the thinkers from the medieval times, um, <clears throat> there they were, they were opposed to usury laws. If you don't know what they are, look them up. They were opposed to, uh, they were, the, the St. Thomas Aquinas and all, they believed in, in free choice. People had choices. They also believed that people made rational choices. St. Thomas Aquinas, part of what he uh, believed was uh, sort of philo philosophical about human development and social organization, how we combine as a society as well as individual actions and choices. So part of that concept that we all had free choice and that when we make those choices, those choices are made based on our own personal subjective feelings. So when you went into a store and you decided to buy a bottle of water versus a bottle of soda, it was because you weighed the cost and the benefits. Maybe water was cheaper. Maybe it was more expensive. Maybe a long term, 50 years of soda drinking will, will lead you to diabetes. So you made personal choices. Some days you knew that was the choice, but you chose soda anyway. Some of the other early influences on the Austrian School of Economics had to do with people like um, uh, Frederick Batiste, who was uh, famous for the broken window fallacy, and Say, uh, another French philosopher, economist, who um, basically said there's really no such thing long term to overproduction and underconsumption. And that's an important concept. What it comes down to is pricing in the market will take care of everything. Unfortunately, government officials don't remember that. So they think that, that because people aren't buying something, that that's a problem, when all it means is that the price is too high. There will be a buyer for everything. It's just a question of price. Again, let's talk Austrian economics and compare it to the British uh, economic model of the uh, late 19th to early 20th centuries. The British were very objective in looking at a cost basis and calculating labor uh, based on that. And, and of course, when you consider economics and value and labor, if, if labor is the basis from which value is generated, then you lead to Marxism, which is that uh, the workers are all important and the capitalist is nothing but a parasite who sucks the uh, value out of the laborer's labor. Now, if you believe that, then you would be a Marxist. And um, we have a whole list of countries who have failed due to their, to their implementation of the Marxist economic philosophy, okay? You may not remember the Soviet Union, but it existed for many years and it crumbled under its own weight. Now, <clears throat> a capitalist recognizes that labor can be enhanced not tenfold, twentyfold, hundredfold or more just by adding capital to it. So that is why we are a capitalist society. Now, uh, I mentioned Karl Menger as, as the founder of the Austrian School because in 1871 he, he published his Principles of Economics and he had a number of disciples. One of them was Ludwig von Mises and uh, his, uh, his 
first rule of economics is to tell the government they should not do it. Okay? Recognize that uh, price plays a vital role in the economy, so um, Austrians believe, the Austrian School of Economics believes, there should have been no government bailouts in 2008. There should have been no stimulus in 2009. So that's critical of both the, the Bush administration in 2008 and the Obama administration in 2009. Both those fly in the face. They, they are crony capitalism. That's where the government is deciding the winners and losers and not the market. Because if you have a good that you want to sell, then sell it on the open market. See who, who's willing to buy it, at what price they're willing to pay for it, how many people buy it at different prices. And if you want to sell more, then you probably have to lower your price. That's the way the market works, the free market. When you get into crony capitalism, you get into things back in the Middle Ages, the, the royal bread maker and the royal uh, carriage maker and all those government instituted monopolies. That's crony capitalism at its beginning. Today, crony capitalism takes shape in stimulus, quote unquote stimulus, that uh, is giving to various uh, businesses, particularly ones that governments want to encourage, like the green energy ones that aren't, aren't terribly effective. They're not cost effective at all, but the government's giving handouts. Uh, if you don't remember the, the name Solyndra, look it up, because there's a perfect example we no longer have uh, the royal bread makers and the royal wheel makers, but we do have Solyndra, which was billion dollars or half a billion dollars given to a company to produce green energy, and they went belly up because the government is trying to choose winners and losers. In the Austrian School of Economics, we know we don't try to choose winners and losers. Let the market decide. If there's a, a market for green energy, it will happen isn't a market, then it would be inefficient to waste money spending trying to what create one government. Well, since Marx believed that capitalism was exploitive, he believed that it was necessary for the government to impose a solution. But the Austrians feel that it is government that is exploitive and that the free market is the best way to determine the needs and wants of individuals because those individuals will make the choices one at a time at the margin. They'll decide everything that they you know, when people say they don't have enough money to live on. Well, that's, that can be true, but it all depends on what choices you're making. I do travel a bit, but at the same time, I live in a house that needs some work. I've made some choices. The free market, as the Austrians know, is going to be the creator of the most diverse market possible. Not the least diverse. In fact, it is government and socialism that will lead to the least diverse market. And one of the problems with, with the lack of diversity is there's nowhere to go if you have no choices. So the beauty of a free market is a diverse economy that allows you to, to, to choose from so many different options. And let's go back to, to Adam Smith and his principles of specialization really clarified every job that can be split into two or three different jobs ends up maximizing productivity and creates additional variety of jobs in the workplace. So if you don't like one job, you have an option to move to another. So it is the free market and diversity that creates economic growth, not government policy.